Good morning and welcome to our service today on this first Sunday of November. And we are also remembering uh, the November the 11th. The, we're going to have a moment of silence as uh, we remember those who have enabled us to preserve our freedom, the many who sacrificed their lives. So let's take a moment and just uh, have a moment, of, a minute of silence as we reflect on these things. Oh, 
figure out why Heather was telling me to go this. I thought you meant go this way. <laughs> so lovely to see all of you this morning. And uh, this is a beautiful day today, isn't it? We could almost go golfing. Not quite. Join with me in our call to worship. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord. For God keeps faith with us forever. Praise our God who brings justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. We will worship the Lord who lifts up those who are bowed down and supports the orphan and widow. God will reign in mercy and righteousness for all generations. Let us praise the Lord and seek to honor God with our lives. with our prayers of confession, followed by the Lord's Prayer, which will be on the screen. God of justice and peace, we gather at this solemn time of the year, aware of the costliness of war, in the face of hostility between nations and neighbors, you have asked us to be peacemakers, to be agents of love and compassion to all we meet. In this time of worship, renew us in the hope that you will turn swords into plowshares and lead the world you love away from the study of war to the promise of peace with justice for all your peoples. God of justice and mercy, we confess that in the world today there are so many conflicts between nations, between ethnic groups, and between political persuasions. Countries turn disputes over territory into threats of terror. Old enemies stir up conflict within their tribes and nations. We confess we have not learned from past conflicts what leads to peace with justice among nations and neighbors. Forgive us and lead us in a better way through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that in and through faith in Christ, we enjoy God's peace, God's grace, and God's forgiveness. Thanks be to God. I have a reader that's going to come at this time. The response of reading today is from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise, praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. 
Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings in, who cannot save. When their spirit, spirit departs, departs, they return to the ground. ground. On that, On that very, very day, day, their, their plans, plans come, come to nothing. nothing. Blessed are those who help it, is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the, the sea and, and everything, everything in them. He, he remains faithful, faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion. For all, for all generations. generations. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. The New Testament reading is from Colossians 3, 1 to 4, 12 to 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. The words of our Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation and reflections of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was thinking, um, this working all right? You can hear me? I can move over here? I was thinking this morning, for some reason, it popped into my head that in, in my previous church, one of the things we did at Remembrance Day, we, we created a, an ecumenical service. I must confess, um, it was a lot of work. <laughs> but it just so happened, I had the moderator of the General Assembly preaching that day, that morning. So this was an afternoon service, so we had the moderator of the General Assembly. I had the Anglican Bishop of Ontario there as well. I had the um, Catholic priest from the cathedral, one of them. Uh, who else did I have? Must have been a Baptist there or something. Anyway, we had a whole bunch of people. And uh, it just reminded me how far we have come, we good Presbyterians, in the last hundred years. Because that would not have happened a hundred years ago. Last week, we spoke about our heritage in the Reformation of Luther and his understanding that faith was faith alone and grace alone. It's a famous Latin phrase, sola fadia and sola gratia. Salvation by faith alone and by grace alone. That was at the heart of Luther's Reformation. And that formula is central to all of our churches in the Reformed community, including this one. 
But since 1950s, the ecumenical movement has softened these lines considerably. Until recently, the lines between us were pretty sharp, very bold. I remember vividly a pastoral visit I made to one of my parishioners. She was in her 90s. She was almost blind, but she still lived in her own apartment. I remember her stove had these huge <laughs> letters on them to make sure she knew where one and two was. And she, she told me the story that when her daughter married a Catholic boy, her husband refused to allow her to go to the wedding. Men had power in those days, guys. <laughs> Things are different now. In the Atlantic magazine a few years ago, there was an article which said, why can't Christians get along 500 years after the Reformation? It argues that until recently, the rifts of the Reformation were insurmountable. Mark Knoll, a historian at Notre Dame University writes, the idea that Catholics and Protestants would get together to cooperate on anything is just almost unimaginable before 1960s. In my lifetime, he says, there has been a sea change in Protestant-Catholic relations opening up an unimaginable array of cooperation. Part of that was probably Vatican II, which helped. Early in my parish ministry, I used to attend different churches when I was on holiday, you know, the Sundays off. I didn't go golfing, I went to church. And one of the churches I would go to is around the corner from my house was a Catholic parish. And I went there with my notebook because I wanted to learn from the priest how they did things. And I loved the color and the, and the music and the pageantry and the mass. And I took notes on it. And yes, I went up and I received the wafer from the priest and I also received real wine. And I incorporated some of that service into our service, and people loved it. But meanwhile, Protestant denominations continue to fracture. The United Methodist Church, one of the biggest denomination, Protestant denominations in the in U.S., claims 12 million members. The Anglican community, also huge, has 85 million members. Presbyterian Church USA, with almost only one and a half million members, have all experienced bitter conflict and division. Over what? Let me, let me guess. Sexuality. One of the strengths of the, of the Roman Catholic teaching and practice is their emphasis on spirituality. I spent seven years working in Christian publishing. And I spent many hours with Catholic publishers. One of my biggest customers was Daughters of St. Paul bookstore in North Toronto. They used to buy dozens of my books. And the person who managed that store was a nun who became a very close friend. In fact, when she was transferred to Rome, Gail and I visited her there. I also worked closely with a guy called Bob Burns, who was the sales manager at Paulus Press in New Jersey. Paul, Bob told me that he had never met a Protestant until he was in his 20s. <laughs> he lived in a very close Catholic community. His mother, his, his, wife, his sister was a nun. His brother was a priest. They had never been outside that community. Now he was working with Paulus Press, which was open to Protestants as well as Catholics. 
one of the major presses, by the way, Christian presses in the U.S. I still remember the, the time that Bob, Gail, and I sat on the beach in Long Island. That was the kind of relationship we had. My other memory <laughs> is visiting Alba House on Staten Island, which was like entering the medieval world. It was all dark, mysterious, and scary. Those are the two Catholic worlds. I know which one I liked. Our reading today from Colossians brings us face to face with the challenge of a commitment to the Christian way of being and acting. And this passage captures what we call in theological language, sanctification. Or in everyday English, that our lives are set apart to God. Being justified by faith doesn't mean we continue to live as we please. No, here Paul reminds his Christian readers that justification was only the beginning of their life with God. It was only the beginning of the process of becoming Christian. And so he challenges them to commit themselves to God and to lean into holiness of life. Their lives need to reflect this new reality into which they have been born. If you have been raised with Christ, he says, Seek the things that are above, where the source of your life is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Christians are people in whom repentance, grace, and forgiveness continue to change the way they see the world. We are committed to loving God and neighbor, which Jesus reminded us is to fulfill all the commandments. Paul reminds us, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, Humility, meekness, patience. Bear one with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, don't slap them in the face. Don't confront them with hate. Forgive each other. Because you've been forgiven. Yes, grace has changed our lives. Forgiveness has washed over us and shifted our hearts toward God. In short, it means that as Christians, we are open to grow into people whose spiritual lives are central to who they are. And we can learn from Catholicism how to deepen that. Because that's one of their strengths. I read uh, Curtis Gillespie's book, Playing Through. Now I know this is a story about golf and you golfers should read it. But it's much more than that. It's about life. It's about spirituality seen through the eyes of his life and how it intersected with family and golf and children and the mystical geography of Eastern Scotland, where I come from. Curtis Gillespie and Jack Marson are playing golf on the challenging Gullen number one course on the Lothian course, coast about 17 miles south of Edinburgh. Curtis has been a student at St. Andrews and on the varsity golf team there in the 
late 80s. He's returned from Edmonton to do a year's sabbatical study with his wife, his two girls, where he was going to write in Gullen. Curtis and his good friend Jack, an 81-year-old, <laughs> stood on the seventh tee, which is the highest point on the Lothian coast. And on a fine day, the view from that point is stunning when it's sunny. And there before you lie the North Sea with its long stretches of sandy beaches and to the north, the hills of Fife and the city of Edinburgh. Curtis describes the effect of this view on him. The view flushed me to the core with light and space and color. It was a spot of such majesty that time and again, I tried to find adequate words for it and I could not. Almost makes you believe in God, I said, looking oceanward. Are you not religious, son, jackass? I like to think that there's something out there, though. It's not so much that I believe in God. It's just that, well, I guess I, I just hope that there's something else out there. I don't know what it is, but I think it would be, I don't know, a little depressing <laughs> if, this, if this world, great as it is, was it? You know what I mean, Jack? Jack goes on to tell Curtis that it was the war that destroyed any faith that he might have had. So Curtis goes on. I like to think there's something out there. I'd like to believe in something. Has the wonder of the creation crept unawares under the barriers to you seeing life as it really is? Through spiritual eyes? Somehow these experiences raise profound questions for us about the meaning of life. How do I fit into this universe? Where is this all going? Is this it? Think about, just for a moment, about the last time you had such a moment of spiritual insight. What was it like? Because what Curtis is describing in his book is not an intellectual idea coaxed into existence by the view. What he's describing is what arouses his spirit within him and the deepest part of him. What does it all mean? Such feelings deep inside us can be religious epiphanies that point us back to who we truly are as spiritual beings created in the image of God. That's who we are. And so Paul can write, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body as church. And be thankful. Stop grumbling. Oh no, it's not there, sorry. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing. May God enable us to be those kind of people. With that kind of openness. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Glory.
has done. God so loved the world, freely sending the Son, who yield his life and atonement for sin, and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear God's voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give God the glory who great things has done. The purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God that when the offender repenting believes through Jesus atonement, the pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear God's voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give God the glory who great things has done. God has taught us great things God has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our gladness when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear God's voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give God the glory who great things has done. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of all ages past and hope of years to come, we gather in this season of rem remembrance, grateful that you hold each one of us in your memory and your mystery, now and for all the time to come. Today we remember all those who served to uphold justice and freedom in the wars of the last century and in the conflicts of our own generation and in the peacekeeping efforts and relief efforts around the world. And especially today we pray for those who have died in this service, perhaps members of our families, friends, relatives, and for those who carry the scars on body and soul that have returned from conflict, we remember their courage and we pray for their families who still ache for lives surrender at a great cost. Lord, we remember before you the victims of conflict, hiding in forgotten corners of the world longing for safety and peace. Think of the people of Afghanistan who fear for their lives and their future. We think of today of the conflict going on in Ethiopia between rebel groups and the government 
for the victims of this struggle, women and children especially, who feel the brunt of this conflict. Think of the conflict in Sudan and pray for peace and justice in that struggle. Lord, we remember those around us who carry on under the burden of sad and hard memories, weighed down by grief and disappointment and anger and pain and loss. Inspire us to offer a listening ear and an understanding heart whenever we can. Healing and generous God, we continue to pray for Noah's healing, for his sisters, and we remember Kim today, especially. We're thankful for the good news that Rachel is back with us and that the family is now clear. Our prayers go out to Ivan's mother and the whole family during her illness. We also bring to you members of our own congregation who seek your healing presence at this time. Charlene, Ruth, Roy, perhaps many others who are not named, but we in the silence bring them to you. We bring all of these prayers, Lord, to you in faith and trusting that you hear us and answer according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today and always. Amen.